Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to In The Zone. <clears throat> I'm Rich Sutter. I'm here with MVP Pete Coles, <clears throat> and we've got an unbelievable show for you this week. We're excited to be here. Uh, the basketball season has concluded. <clears throat> We're a tiny, tiny bit sad about that. But in the 22-23 basketball season, I don't know that you could have asked for a better season, more excitement, <clears throat> a lot of fluidity to the basketball season, fluidity to the basketball season. And the UConn Huskies coming out on top. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but as always, Pete, we want to jump right in. <clears throat> and we want to get into the feed em fish bracket. And we want to get right out and give a shout out here. I'm walking down the street, and as I said to you before the show, we accumulated 215 YouTube video watches before we came in here. That's exciting. And as I said to somebody before, we are absolutely in the zone right now, and in the zone is going spiral. <laughs> so they stopped, and they said, Rich, you know it's viral, right? And I said, what happens after you go viral? You get so hot, you go spiral <laughs> right after viral. So in the zone, might even skip viral and head right over to spiral. <laughs> We're on fire. And I wanted to say that I got our first real shout out from the show when I'm walking down the street because I like to walk to work. And so I come out of my house. I was fired up, feeling great that day. I'm walking down the street and there's been construction on my street from uh, the Western Avenue project. We've had a bunch of police officers out there doing a great job. But I get a shout out. This guy goes, hey, Sutter. He goes, is that you? He goes, I love that show in the zone. Did you know that Pete Cowles used to be a dispatcher for the police? <laughs> so it was awesome to walk down the street, hear that from one of our police officers. So we're going to give a shout out to Officer Cracker. Ah, Michael Curran. It's the only name he would give me. Yep. He said, under any circumstances, that's the only name he could give out. He said, you tell him Cracker said hello. <laughs> so we're saying hello to Cracker today because we love all the fans we can get here at In The Zone. We're really having fun with this show, and we hope that you are too. <clears throat> and so also I wanted to give out a shout-out to a, uh, a great, great person in Westfield. He hasn't been feeling great, but he's an unbelievable basketball man. His name is Joe Healy. If you belong to the Sons of Erin, you know Joe real well. Been in a hospital a little bit, hasn't been feeling great, but we are in the zone here. We're wishing Joe a speedy recovery and uh, get back to that basketball court real soon, Joe, watching the games like you love to do. So what we're going to do today, <clears throat> Pete, is we're going to take a little bit of a shift. Okay. And we're going to look at the women's game first because women's basketball has absolutely exploded onto the scene. Don't sprain your ankle jumping onto this bandwagon because <laughs> this was exciting basketball. It was down to the a lot of the games down to the wire, and I could not get over some of the skill level and some of the athleticism on these young women that were playing the basketball Final Four. So I just wanted to get into a little bit. Of course, we have to get into the controversy. We want to get into the little bit of the controversy that happened between Caitlin Clark and the other young lady, Angela Reese, from LSU. So there was a little bit of back and forth between the game, a little bit of uh, gamesmanship, if you will. Or there's a bit of trash talking uh, a, a, going a, a, on. A little bit of trash talking. And, and I think that people jumped on this a little bit. And, and because the game was on CBS, on national television, and because it drew as many viewers as it did, of course you had this Wild West breakout of, of different opinion that came through the, through the ranks. So I just wanted to get into that just a little, little bit because I thought those two young women represented themselves unbelievably out on the court, and neither one of them really did anything that they have anything to be ashamed of. I thought the take on it, and I hate to say this, but I thought the take on it was sexist. I thought it, it, was, it, was, it was a different set of rules for, for, the, for the way that the women we're being judged and a different set of rules and the way that our men are generally judged. We're going to get into that in a second because I think that it's important, okay? These young women are out there playing their heart out. And in basketball, sometimes you can get caught up in the moment. Sometimes emotion overrides 
any other thing that goes on in, inside your body. All of that good intellect, all of those good things that go on inside your head sometimes give way to the heart. And sometimes emotion spills over. And that's some of the part of what people like about the basketball arena is as that emotion does come into play in that emotion is part of the game. So I just wanted to go back to a little bit of the thing with with the two players beforehand. Here's what I think they should do. I think the two of those players should form a bond. I think the two of those players are unbelievably hot together in a, in a marketing environment. So what I would do is I would form a bond if I was the two of them, and I would come out and I would brand it. I don't know if you want to call it Tiger Hawk, because we got one LSU Tiger and we've got a Hawkeye on the other side. We'll call it Tiger Hawk brand. Okay, but one thing I do know is back in the day, we used to have a Clark bar. And I also know that Reese's still produces a peanut butter cup. So maybe we put the two of these together and we come out with the best candy bar you've ever tasted in your life. Who knows? We'll call it a rock bar. I don't know. But what I did want to comment on is when they started to do the thing where they're pointing to the ring on the finger or, or Caitlin Clark originally started with the, the thing up in her face where you can't see me. Okay. That's the John Cena thing. I want to remind people of, of certain things that have gone on. Let's remember Dikembe Mutombo. Every time Dikembe Mutombo blocked the shot, he gave the no, no, no. Yes, he did. Okay. <laughs> Larry Bird, my favorite all-time player, talked more trash than a New York City sanitation worker. Okay, and now every single night, LeBron James comes out, grabs a whole bunch of chalk dust, rubs his hands together, and throws it up into the air. Where's FEMA on that one? Where's the great national outcry on that? Okay, but when we have two young ladies who do the same thing, oh my God, the, the mores and the norms of society have broken down. And I think they got treated unfairly there. Okay, I really do. We have a lot of things going on in the game right now. And so I just want to educate everybody to a little bit of that. Okay, in the men's game, if you see people sitting on the bench and everybody starts tapping the top of their head, that means you just got dunked on. Okay, it's a symbol. Everybody sits there and taps the top of their head. It means somebody just got dunked on. Okay, if they give you a symbol where they go down to the ground and they hold their hand way down to the ground, it means you're too small to cover me. And so these things go on in the game every single night, and I want somebody to go back and tell me when was the last time an NBA player got cited for trash talking. So I thought it was a little bit on the other side of midnight. I really enjoyed watching the game. I thought it was a bit of a distraction after the game because it took away from some of the really good basketball that occurred. And so I just wanted to start off my show right there with a little bit of that pump for the ladies game because I thought it was sensational. I think it's a thing of the future. And I think if you're on the men's side and you've been a, a big proponent or possibly you work in the, in the environment of men's college basketball, I would sit up and take notice to the women's ratings right now. And I would sit up and take notice to that. And the first question I would ask myself is, do we have something to do with that? Is our product being diminished to the point where people are now starting to look for another product? And I think if the men's side sits down and really starts to examine what they've done with the NIL, all of the league shifting, all of the pay games, all of the pay for play with the players, I think people are tiring of that a little bit and, and long for the real, real purity of college basketball. And I think they're finding that in a women's game. And, Absolutely. And, I, and I couldn't be more excited about it yep. because that's how you'll get recalibration when people start spending their dollars elsewhere. And so I would like to see these two young ladies get together, have an NIL deal and make millions of dollars because that's what they do. And and when I say this now, and, and I would say this um, in, in all humility, when the women's side does maybe make that turn and start to get to the point where they're, they have an equal footing or they're starting to produce numbers on television that the men's game produces, I wouldn't settle for equal pay, ladies. I'd go for more. I'd ask for the most because then you'll know true value when you ask for more. You can always ask to be equal, but when you actually produce more, ask for more because that's what you're worth. And so now, Pete, we got to go right to the UConn Huskies. That was an unbelievable basketball game, but there have been few teams on the men's side of the bracket that have done the MOV like we've seen right here. And people sit there and say, Rich, what are you talking about MOV? MOV is margin of victory. They won every single one of their games by double digits. Right. At least, was it at least 13, I think is what I heard? They were very, very... Uh, 
games that were over sometimes at halftime yeah. in the NCAA tournament against very, very credible opponents. What they did to Gonzaga was simply uh, astonishing, really. And, it, and when you sit there and say, how did everybody miss that? How did everybody not think UConn was the best team in the country? I'll explain it to you. They went through the Big East season at 13-7. and seven. They lost to Xavier twice. They had, they had a pretty good out-of-conference record, but they devoured as many cannolis as anybody in the country. And so when you get to it and you say you look at their body of work, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. But then I'd ask the NCAA selection committee, after all of that, how did they get a four seed and you had Duke and Miami in the five hole? Those are some salient questions that I would have for the NCAA selection committee because when I looked at the body of work, when I went back and I said, how did we miss this? I said, we didn't. They just clicked at the right time. They got hot at the right time, and that's always cool in college basketball. But I think that's something that um, is great about the NCAA tournament, but also credit to Coach Hurley because he kept his team on an even balance. But I think one thing that if you really, really want to notice, the biggest difference in UConn's play, it came in their coaching. And if you watch Bobby Hurley in the, up to the middle of the season, you'll see a very, very different person on that sidelines. I don't know who sat him down. Maybe it was his dad. Maybe it was his wife. Maybe it was somebody close to him. But somebody sat him down and said, your behavior on the sidelines is distracting from your team's performance. And... What it was was it was a situation on the sideline where you're talking about every call, you're up and down. You look if you look at some of these coaches on the sidelines, they look like they're suffering while they're coaching. They look like they're 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 having a an episode while they're coaching. They look like they're in such anguish. And I think what a lot of them would be would be favorable to do is go back and watch some of the old Barack Obama tapes <clears throat> when he was running for president as a young U.S. senator. Look at the calm. Look at the way he handled himself in those really stressful situations. And maybe young coaches can get back to more of that model because that's exactly what changed in Danny Hurley and that's exactly what changed in his team's behavior. His behavior on the sidelines changed. His team's behavior changed drastically out on the floor. Well, he trusted his people to do their jobs. Uh, he, said, he didn't try to micromanage the he, team. He, he said it in a press conference, you know, that we have three first-round NBA picks here. I think he might have four. And, and he said, I filled in with some really, really good complimentary players. And so in the zone, we love music, you know. And so when you talk about blue, the Huskies blue, it was a blue letter that they sent to San Diego State Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> it was Crystal Blue Persuasion by Tommy James and the Shondells. It was unbelievable the way that team gelled, moved the ball, shared the ball. I also think you have a situation where they were behind blue eyes for a little while by the who. They were sitting there and everybody's looking and saying, who is this team? What are they all about? You know, but then at the end of the day, they got San Diego State tangled up in blue by Bob Dylan. And at the end of the day, the fans are singing Song Song Blue by Neil Diamond. And I think those are some great, great songs right there. But also in the zone, I'm going to go and. Every week, if I can remember to do this, I'm going to offer you two songs that I love, and I'm going to offer them up to you, and you can go back and listen to them. And now, these are two songs that aren't like, oh, my God, it's not Diana Ross, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which everybody has and everybody loves. I'm going to give you two songs that I think you might like and that you might not have ever heard. Okay, the first song we're going to give out today is Wavelength by Van Morrison. It's an unbelievable song. You won't know Van Morrison is singing it. And if you're up in the morning and you want to put on some music and get moving around your house, like Springsteen says, you put that song in, that'll get your day hopping perfect. Okay? I'll give you one more. It's by the Eagles, and it's called Try to Love Again, written by Randy Meisner right after his divorce. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, and I urge you to look in on that one and try. So we go back to what happened with you, Con Pete. What did you think happened? I, I think that they they just kind of just realized who they were and they played their game and nobody had an answer for that game. <clears throat> it surprised me because I thought the women's team would actually, the UConn women's team would actually go farther than they did. And I was surprised when the UConn men's team was still going when they did. And, and it blew my mind. I think San Diego State, I kind of caught a little bit of that game against FAU. I think that that was their peak. That was where they peaked out. And and that that was an emotional win for them when I believe they won at the buzzer, yeah. And and that was it for them. They had nothing left in the emotional column coming into the championship game. Yeah, they got themselves up, but 
I think that their championship game was the SD and FAU game. Yeah, it was. And they had nothing left for UConn. It was such an exciting finish to the game to win at the buzzer like that. Right. They had nothing left. I think what also you saw there is Coach Dutcher is a little bit of an old school coach, and, and Coach Hurley's a little bit more in the new school. And I think the new school offensively is is winning a little bit here. Um, I say that lightly because if we take a look, and, and maybe this would be worth almost a whole show someday, is you could go through some, since I've been coaching, everybody says coaches are geniuses. And to be honest with you, that's that's not true at all. What happens is somebody comes up with a really good idea in college basketball and then everybody else follows it. All right, I'll give you an example. When Bobby Knight was winning, every coach in the country, including my high school coach and into college, started running motion offense. It was three guards with two posts, and it, cre- it created some big men space around the basket. Okay. Over time, Tom Davis came to Boston College, put in the flex offense. The flex offense was an offense which was really, really difficult to cover, and it made all five of your players move at all different times. Uh, John Calipari came in with Vance Wahlberg, brought in something called dribble drive motion, which was a much more open spaced ability to space the floor and beat people off the dribble than it was based upon passing and screening. And now you'll come into where you saw Danny Hurley's offense, kind of a hybrid of that dribble drive motion. I call it, they, they, they beat San Diego State with what I call the triple B approach. Okay, Their balance was incredible. Everybody who came into that game contributed. They would bring a guy off the bench, he comes in and hits a three. Bring the next guy off the bench, he came in and hit a three. Their ability to bring people off the bench and have them contribute just kept the pressure on San Diego State so intensely that they just couldn't break it. So I thought the triple B approach for them was balance. That was the first approach. The second one was their boogie, okay, what I refer to as boogie. That's a New York City term about how well you can dribble, how well you can beat guys off the dribble, how well you can get at the basket. I thought UConn, with their guard play, their boogie was exceptional, okay? And basically, the last piece of it is what the young players like to call boom. When they hit a three-point shot, they like the whole gym to yell boom. And you'll see that all over the place these days. And UConn came out, and boy, did they go boom. They hit three-point shots all throughout the tournament. They dropped Miami early on with their three-point shooting. They came out. Struggled. And it was all timely shooting, too. And and timely with, with shots of, okay, the team makes a run. We come back and hit three threes in a row and go on a 9-0 run. That was the type of shooting that they had where they were shooting the ball when it mattered, you know, as you're talking about, Pete. And that was just... I thought really, really uh, the difference between them. As we said this again, go back to earlier shows. We said one of the things you have to do in the NCAA tournament is you have to make shots. You have to be able to be open, find that spot, and make shots. And they did. And I thought uh, Sonogo was terrific inside because I was worried about San Diego State's inside play. Their two big men are terrific and very physical, very strong. And I thought Sonogo went in there and he handled both of them uh, for a bit. And uh, Carabin also did a great job. But I like Donovan Klingon in there as well. They had a kind of a three-head monster going in there. And, and UConn was able to. I thought if San Diego State had any chance at all, it was going to be on their front line and to see how well they could dominate on that front line. But when you come right down to it, it, did, it came right down to the fact they made more shots than other teams did. And that put other teams in a different defensive position as far as their offense. You saw San Diego State come out in that first five minutes of the game, very fluid uh, offensively. They looked good. You thought, okay, this team can run up and down with UConn. And then all of a sudden it just changed because UConn took over the, the whole tempo of the game. UConn took over the whole fluidity of the game. And basically when they start hitting shots like that in space, the floor, you can't guard Sonogo inside. You can't guard Klingon inside one on one. And so when those shots started going, they became almost impossible to stop. Well, you, you put the other. This is UConn's mo. It seems like they figured out. They they, they kind of sat back for a little bit. Let the other team do their thing. <clears throat> Never knock them out of their game right off the bat. Observe, react, counter, and then once you put the other team on their heels. They, they, there's no way for them to get once they're out of their game. They started. That's when they started putting them away, and they it seemed to me, looking at scores and seeing bit of highlights here and there, it seems to me once they put them on their heels, they never let go of that that feeling, and and they just mentally check them out of games. 
Yeah, we, it, it's called running downhill in our business. They were they got going, and as you said, it was kind of like they would they would get a little bit of a gate out of the front, take it easy, feel it out, almost like a heavyweight boxer. You know, they're going to come out in that first round. They're going to feel it out. Don't want to get knocked out right away. They just want to get in and throw a few punches. But then once they start to deliver, once they start to move around, and when you say um, a boxing match, you look at the combinations that UConn was able to throw at San Diego State. They threw combination after combination. And when you see a player, and I can't understand why most NBA draft boards, I, maybe they'll update the draft boards after this. We're going to talk about this later in, in the segment. But I can't understand how Andre Jackson at six foot nine, with his ball handling ability, his passing ability, and the way he plays the game so unselfishly isn't on a lot of people's draft board. I, I look at the draft board right now and I don't know how some of the young men who go into the NCAA are represented on that board in the way that when you have people that are in the G League or what they call overtime elite now. I mean, who are those guys actually playing against? You know, nobody knows. Nobody even knows who's in those leagues. And I think the NCAA tournament and the NCAA regular season has always been a really good marker. But if you look at anybody's mock draft, you really struggle to find like maybe five or six NCAA players in that draft. And we're going to talk about that and, and what the, the, the disposition is with some of the general managers in there and what they're thinking about and, and why so many of these drafts don't turn out well. I'm going to tell you right now, we went into a draft situation last year. And I was on the phone with a number of different people that are in the NBA circuit, a number of different people that are involved in drafting players. And I said, anybody who drafts Holmgren is going to wind up not having him in his first season at all. And they drafted him number two overall. And I thought that that was unbelievably egregious to draft in that position. I think the same thing's going to occur this year. But if you go back to UConn, who are the draftables for them? because they kind of blend so much, you know. Mm -hmm. Hawkins, obviously, Andre, Andre Jackson and Hawkins are both first-round picks. Sonogo, I think, is an interesting look because he, he certainly has all the skill that you would want in an NBA player, but sometimes big men who are able to push people around in the NCAA get up to the NBA level, and then everybody's big like that up there, and, and, and I don't know where his skill level carries him. But I think there's at least three first-rounders on that team um, that are really, really exciting. And for UConn, where does this place UConn <clears throat> is a question I wanted to ask people today, too. Where does this place UConn in the whole echelon of basketball royalty? Who are the teams in, since, the year, since the year 2000, I believe, that they've won five championships right. with three different coaches? You have Jim Calhoun, Kevin Ali, and now you have Danny Hurley. And so to look also inside of what the Hurley family has accomplished, it's really, really quite a story there. Their dad is in the Naismith Hall of Fame as a high school basketball coach. His brother, Danny uh, Hurley, uh, Bobby Hurley, excuse me, played at Duke, won the national title as a player at Duke, and now is the head coach at Arizona State, doing a really good job out there, I think, too, and a tough job. And now Danny's come home, and Danny played at Seton Hall, and now Danny's won the national title as a coach. And so that family, I mean, they should just put the whole family into the Naismith <laughs> Hall of Fame right now, if you ask me. Uh, but it's just exciting to watch because I did know the dad when I was back there. I watched the young boys play when they were younger and, uh, and enjoyed Bobby Hurley's uh, career at Duke and, 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 and watching uh, and, and watching them grow as coaches has been really exciting and really, really fun. And so... I'll tell you a quick interesting story about that. When I was an assistant coach at Archbishop Malloy, I had the pleasure to coach a young man by the name of Kenny Anderson, who was the second, I think, overround draft pick in the NBA draft, played at Georgia Tech, led them to the Final Four, played in the NBA for the Nets and the Celtics for many, many years. And when Kenny was a sophomore and a junior, I got to meet just about every college coach in the country during that time that was at a major school, Digger Phelps, Mike Krzyzewski, Dean Smith, every single coach came into our gym looking at, at the different players that we had. And so Duke at the time was also recruiting a young man by the name of Bobby Hurley. And so Mike Bray was the assistant coach at uh, Duke at the time, and I was working at at uh, Malloy and, and, and Mike came down and he said, you know, I worked at DeMatha, you know, I know what it's like to be on the high school level and everything like that. And he said to me, we have a really, really good shot at signing Bobby Hurley. And we also love Kenny. He said, but in this business, you have to be able to get 
what you can get. Mm-hmm. You know, and, he, and I, he says, what do you think are our chances with Kenny? I said, I am not 100% sure, but I'll tell you this. If you do get Bobby Hurley, I'd not stop recruiting Kenny. I would pursue the both of them because you'd have the best backcourt in the country. And they wound up signing Bobby Hurley. Kenny went to Georgia Tech, and they both had unbelievable careers. Kenny went to the Final Four. Bobby wound up uh, eclipsing uh, that and going to the final game uh, with his team with Grant Hill and uh, Christian Leitner, and they had a great run also as well. So a great run for the Hurley family. Unbelievable, uh, unbelievable run. Where I'd like to close out this segment with the college basketball piece of it is just to reflect again, we've, we've gone on the show and we've, and we've really, really teared this thing down a little bit, torn it down. Um, but I want to just go back into the NIL situation again, just for one minute, because the NIL, again, name, image, and likeness has allowed for, to, for, for the whole landscape of college basketball to be shifted. And I was sitting there thinking in my car, I was driving home and I had a pretty decent ride in front of me. I'm sitting there and I was thinking about the upcoming show. What are we going to talk about and, and how we have kind of knocked on the NIL door and, and kind of torn it down, kicked it down a little bit. But I also wanted to talk about, I wonder how some of the coaches feel about that because there are certain coaches that have no NIL deal at all. When any of them actually admit to it, if they were pissed off about it. Right. They, they, they don't have any NIL deals at all. They might be able to do a little bit of this, a little <clears throat> bit of that. But every day of the week, if you're a low division tier one team, you're going to get beat to your, to your own player every single day of the week, twice on Sunday. And so, but where the piece of it where I started to examine the coaching piece of it, and it became real interesting to me, is that even the coaches who are doing well with the NIL, do they feel comfortable doing this? Because it just looks like, as Beheim alluded to, and as, as Lou Saban alluded to during the year, it looks like you can just buy a team now. Yeah, or every season you're selling your soul to somebody exactly. to make sure you can field the competitive team. But then how does that make you a good coach? Right. How does that make you an expert in your field? How does that make you something that you should be highly compensated and rewarded for? Because seemingly you could bring in just about anybody to coach a team that has all of those great players on it. All you have to do is accumulate a good NIL amount of money. But I always thought about that from not only the players' perspective. Some players get 400000 Some players get 25000 Some players get zero. And then in the locker room, you're sitting there saying – okay, they now, some of the players in here are getting greater salaries than the assistant coaches. You also have a situation where, again, do the coaches know, do the coaches have that feeling of like, I didn't even earn this. You know, when you take that away from people, when you remove that from people, yeah, you can keep going and collecting the trophies all you want, but it degrades what you're collecting. It absolutely degrades what you're doing, and that has and that has value. And so you have to ask, has that diminished the value of this great thing that we all love? Well, does it take the fun out of it for them? Like, is that you? I, might you see coaches leaving or retiring earlier and just saying, "Yeah, I'm, I'm good." I think you've seen some of that happen already. With uh, in the last two years, you've lost Coach Shashevsky, Roy Williams. Uh, who knows what will happen with Coach Self at Kansas because he's had some health problems at the end of the year. Jim Beheim, after 47 years, has decided to pack it in. So I think you're seeing some of that already, where coaches are saying, "This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I'm looking to do." And as we've said before, the money never comes out of the school's pocket. The money doesn't come from the money that these players generated. It comes from external sources. And as long as it can come from external sources, you're going to wind up with uh, influences that you shouldn't have in the game. You're going to wind up with people owing in certain situations. And then it, it's not going to be long before you're going to be able to target some of the games that you think were fixed or games that you thought might not have come out the right way. Well, and that's an interesting you say that now because with gambling coming online in a lot more states, especially on college basketball and other sports, every time could that I, now be a factor? Every time I turn on my phone, I have, a, I have a, an ad from something in Massachusetts, which is either DraftKings or MGM, and they're incentivizing me to sign up. Yep. And what they're also doing is they're incentivizing people to um, 
they're, they're incentivizing people with, with a gift on the way in, which gives them a, an ability to start gambling. But then what it does is it, 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 it really, gambling is a very, very serious addiction. And I think it's, the legalization of that really might have come with a little bit uh, greater scrutiny into actually what can happen to families, what can happen to people that get involved in that, because it is an addiction. It's what drug dealers did in the 80s and 90s to bring cocaine into this country. They gave you free samples until you were hooked, and then when you had to have it, they charged all kinds of money for it, and that's going to happen to a lot of people. You know, The most gambling I do right now is I give my donation to the casino when I go in there to go have some fun, <clears throat> and occasionally I'll play the big lotteries because I know I love her win, but it's good to be thinking you have a shot at it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's all going to be well and good until one of these players that's on a big, big team winds up being in the hole. A significant amount of money happened to Pete Rose. It, it, it happened with Pete Rose. It happened with uh, Art Schleitzer, the quarterback. And um, there's a funny story about that. The the, the quarterback, he was uh, he was really really into gambling. I think he was at Ohio State, and he called up his bookie and he says, uh, "I'm I'm I'm in the hole, you know, and I need a couple of games to get out of the hole here before the end of the week." Because if you're a gambler. The, the week ends on Sunday, and so by Monday, no matter what happens, it's pay time. So what yep. other, whatever losses you've accumulated during the week, you could sit there on Saturday and be down $10,000 and bet it all on Sunday and get even. You can just take one game. So it's not like you pay every single day. It accumulates out through the week. So the young man's on the phone with his bookie, and he says, hey, you know, I want to see what's up tonight. And the bookie says, man, it's late Sunday night. There's not really a whole lot on the board. He goes, it's really, uh, it's, it's nothing happening on the board tonight. We really don't have any games. And the guy goes, look, man, I'm in the hole big time. I need a couple of games here so I can get out of the hole. And the bookie says, I can't create the game for you. I can only tell you what we have on the board. And he goes, and all we have on the board is hockey. And the gambler <laughs> turns back to the guy and goes, man, what do I know about hockey? And the bookie turns back to the gambler and says, son, you're in the whole $300,000. What do you know about anything? <laughs> and that was a college football player at the time, you know, with games where there's a line on his game. And, and all of a sudden, he has a football in his hand at the end of that game. I can't tell you how some of what's happening in the game of college basketball is not only leading that way, it's absolutely flowing that way. Yep. I wanted to go back to our coaching carousel as well because, believe it or not, that's almost stopped spinning. You go and it right, opens up. Right, because the FAU coach signed a long-term deal, right? He's staying. Dusty May is going to stay for now. As I said before on the show, he won too many games. Yeah. He would have been a great great number anywhere of those places, and, and, and he won too many games, so they actually couldn't slow down the, the search and talk to him. But what they like to do also is have at least most of them wrapped up before the Final Four starts. They don't, they don't like distractions at the Final Four. So if you see and go back years, you'll notice that nobody ever gets, final, ever gets fired during the Final Four. They get fired before the Final Four. They might get fired after the Final Four. But this whole coaching carousel takes a spin, and it goes for about a month. And last week, we talked about 13 different jobs. And it was an interesting thing because we actually assigned a grade to every single one of those jobs that we gave out. And then we filled in with who was the old coach, who was the new coach, why did the old coach get fired, and why does the new coach need to do it in order to be successful? And I thought that was really, really cool. But what I went back and I did, because this is something that I used to do when I was uh, trying to maintain my own eligibility for being in college or, or in high school, I learned how to quickly do GPA. And I l quickly learned how to get, assign a grade to something. So what we did was, I took out every single plus and minus grade that we gave and assigned every one of the searches that we looked at a letter grade. And what we did was we took them all, added them up by quality points. If you got an A for your search, we gave you four quality points. If you got a B for your search, we gave you three. If you got a C, you got two. If you got a D, you got one. If you got an F, you wound up with zero. We only gave out one F last week. That was the Manhattan hire of John Gallagher. We gave out that F, but there was a couple of other Ds. Now that we round that up, we average it out amongst all the hires. What do you think was the grade of all the ADs out there in terms of numerical GPA? I bet you it's two. 2.3. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't thrilled about a lot of the picks, as I recall, last week. 
if you went back historically, you would you would look and say, shake your head quite a bit at some of the different hires. And and the funny thing is, is that there's a lot of really good quality people out there that you can hire. Uh, but I don't know what happens on these search processes sometimes. I think maybe that's a good niche for somebody is to open up just a strictly college basketball search committee service, you know, where you come in and only do college basketball searches with somebody who knows what's happening. For example, look at the NBA. The last two commissioners of the NBA were uh, David Sterling, and now they have this guy Silver. Neither one of those gentlemen has ever dribbled a basketball in their life. Maybe very corporate, maybe a lawyer, maybe have a great background with an MBA, a law degree. But what's happened to the MBA is you don't have anybody running it who has a basketball sense. And what happens is they include all of these different things into their format, which has now made the game somewhat untenable because as we're going to talk about right now, the NBA season is about two or three games from concluding. You'll now start the playoff part of the season, and that's the most exciting part of the year for me is the NBA playoffs. I think there'll be some great matchups. We'll talk about those once they're out. But we wanted to just talk about that carousel grade for a second, and, and how do you get to 2.3? We talked about retreads, some of the coaches coming back in. And again, I would think you might consider Dave Paulson to be a bit of a retread. He's had a number of different opportunities, and he came back in, but we did assign that grade an A. And so some of that is subjective. Some of that is, is there's, there's some subjectivity to it. Uh, but what we don't like is for guys who have been around and have constantly lost – and then just keep getting shots. Kevin Loggery, Dick Mata, all the guys in the NBA for years and years and years. They got fired one year, they got fired the next year. Doug Moe, the old Denver Nuggets coach, had the greatest line I ever heard of anybody who got fired. He said, here today, gone to Maui. And then took off for Hawaii until they found him another job and came back and, and wound up coaching somewhere else in the NBA. But that's what we talked about when we talked about retreads. And I thought this year there wasn't a whole lot of that. I thought there was possibly a little bit of recalibration there where, where they're going out and they're going to really look at the body of work and they're going to do some of that. Now, again, how many jobs changed hands on the Division I level? It's upwards of 50 jobs changing hands on the Division I level. There's only 363 total jobs. So when you change 50 of them, my God, that's – you know, a high percentage of the jobs that are changing every single year. If you add up 50 times four, that's 200 jobs out of 363 jobs. And again, as we talked about, some of the top's jobs never move. Syracuse was, was not vacated for 47 years, and they wound up hiring as assistant coach without even a search. And so I think that that's a part of it also that has to be looked at is what is the criteria for the searches? What is the criteria for selecting your next coach? And if we don't start to look more in the Tobin Anderson model of young coaches who've come up through the ranks, who have coached, actually coached games and won at the Division Three, the Division Two, the lower Division One level, I think we're really doing ourselves a disservice. And that's why the carousel spins as widely as it does, is because the ADs have tremendous pressure on them to win the press conference, to show up there with a former NBA player. I'll give you a couple of examples Memphis with Penny Hardaway Vanderbilt with Jerry Stackhouse guys who are famous players pros great college players but really never coached a day in their lives and now they go into these programs almost as figureheads but you see it in some of the in some of the interaction with their team you see it with some of the interaction in their coaching and some of the X's and O's that go on in the game and it's just not it's just, to me, not what it used to be. You know, everything is high ball screen now. Everything is, is being followed in one vein and one direction. There's not a lot of creativity out there. I think that's killing the game as well, too. I think if they took different coaches from different places and different levels, you'd have a different aspect of to what happens in the game. Because right now in Division One, everybody's doing the same thing, and it's boring everybody's doing the same thing. And if I see one more high ball screen, I think I might jump out my window, except <laughs> I live on Western <laughs> Avenue and it's only about five feet high and I wouldn't, nothing would happen to me. I just land on the ground and groan. But I really do think that th there needs to be kind of an eradication of all of this group think that goes on in the coaching process. Whereas, you know, if somebody calls up for one of their assistant coaches, that guy's going to get the job. 
rather than look at the body of work. We can say, oh, we took this guy's assistant coach. It gets the boosters happy. It gets them going. But the people that you have to really think about in this whole formula is the young men in that locker room that are going to be in that locker room, going to be in every single practice for the next three to four years because you don't usually disentangle from a coach within the first year, although Lafayette did with Michael Jordan. Um, and that was – we probably would have shaken our heads at that hire as well too when they did it. And so we shake our heads at a lot of these hires, but they keep on doing it. <coughs> did Bayheim so, have the – did Bayheim probably have the final say in his coaching replacement? I would say that he had a lot to say about it. I don't think Jim Bayheim had the final say as to whether Jim Bayheim got to stay or not. Ooh. Interesting. I think Jim Beheim wanted to stay, and Jim Beheim was told it's time up. Time to retire? Now, in order to make that a little bit more palatable, palatable to Coach Beheim, because Coach Beheim's coached there for 47 years, and every single player that Syracuse wants to raise money from, Carmelo Anthony donated a million dollars to Syracuse, and he played there for one year. Um, they're going to need Coach Beheim on every one of those phone calls. They're going to need Coach Beheim to be invigorated and to be happy about the way things went at Syracuse. So they want so, him to leave on good terms. I, I think in order to say, okay, your time's up, but Red Autry's your guy and, and we'll let him go and be the next coach because there were 200 minimum, 200 resumes that were better than Adrian Autry's for that job. Mike Hopkins is a former assistant coach at Syracuse. He's the head coach at the University of Washington right now. So there's a lot of people out there. You know, Matt Langle beat Syracuse two different times in two years. So he took a guarantee check from Syracuse, probably forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, two different years, defeated them for the first time in the Carrier Dome in Colgate history. And you didn't want to sit down and talk to that young man about your job opening? So I think there was some, some of... Uh, the placation to make uh, to make Coach Beheim happy because they do need him moving forward in the future, and he does have significant cachet in that way. But I don't think Coach Beheim uh, decided when it was time for Coach Beheim to go. I think Coach Beheim, given so the, that's almost in the vein of like seeing Calhoun at the Final Four on the UConn sideline. You know, on the, I'll, I'll tell you how you'll know it wasn't Beheim's decision. Look how close it happened to his final game. It happened immediately immediately after that final game. It happened within a day of that final game. That's how you know it wasn't his decision. Yeah. And 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 that's, you know, after 47 years, it becomes difficult to say, hey, coach, you know, things aren't going well, you know, stick around for a few more, you know, because people, people did love him there. But as much as people loved him there, he was also uh, maligned quite a bit. Uh, up there for different things. He won one national title. I think the people in Syracuse think in 47 years he might have been able to do better than that. I don't know. I think he was a good coach. I think he did a great job up there, represented the program very, very well, had a number of NBA players who, again, have donated back to the program very, very well. But we go with a 2.3, gentlemen. That means you're not on the dean's list. That means you're not on the honor roll, and you need to pick it up. And if you need some help, call us in the zone, and me and Pete will sit down with you, and we'll give you a really good list of names of people that you might want to talk to based upon their body of work, based upon their contribution to basketball, and based upon do you think they're ready to take that next step, which is a big step. And so without further ado, we're going to start to shift the show a little bit towards the NBA. We're also going to shift the show towards our NBA draft analysis, which is what I love. And I can't wait to get into the NBA draft analysis because this is something that I love to do and something that I've done for a long time. And so when I say last year, anybody who drafts Holmgren from Gonzaga is going to regret it. I can't cite enough the model of the player that has great success in the NBA and the model of the player that does not. What is the profile of the greatest NBA players who've ever played the game? Larry Bird was six foot eight. Michael Jordan was six foot seven, six foot six. Grant Hill, six foot six, six foot seven. Kobe Bryant, six foot six, six foot seven. Now you have Chamberlain, you have Russell, you have some of those other guys, but the people, LeBron James, six foot seven, you, the people that they look at as the greatest players of the game generally fit into a body type in the NBA where they're not generally thin. They have very, very solid muscular skeletal sk structure, you know, like LeBron James. And, and when you talk about the upcoming draft, 
when I see these mock drafts that are out there, I really think there's a niche uh, for somebody to come in here and offer up to general managers in the NBA, somebody you know who's watched a ton of basketball games over the course of their life, over the course of this year, and sit there with an eye that says, man, if you take Holmgren, you're going to regret it because you're going to spend millions of dollars on that young man. And he missed 82 games this year. He did not play one single game. He won't be in rookie of the year consideration. He won't be on the all-rookie team. He didn't get to the rookie all-star game. The team that drafted him got absolutely zero production out of him. I think... We're walking into a similar situation this year. The number one pick in everybody's draft board is Oscar Wambayana. And he is from France. He is seven foot five. He has guard skills. He can shoot the ball like Kevin Durant can shoot the ball from the outside. And he is just around the basket at seven foot five with his length. He barely has to leave the floor to dunk the basketball. He is everyone's number one mock draft pick. And I'm going to go out on a limb right now and say that he would not make it through an NBA season in the physical condition that this young man is in right now. They'd beat him up underneath. Physically. Yeah. Physically. Same thing with Holmgren. You're going to go in, you're going to play in all of those games. You're going to require significant physical therapy. You're going to require significant uh, training in order to catch up your strength level. But then at the same time, are you going to be able to match it out on the floor? And when you can't match it out on the floor, generally that's when injury occurs. You have a lot of players that have been in the NBA that have been really, really tall players. Rick Smits was a seven foot four Dutchman. Uh, went to Marist College and then played in the NBA for a number of years for the Indiana Pacers. And, and he had a pretty good career, but his, his foot was always broken. And, and what happens with Bill Walton, 6'11", uh, 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 he's a great, great uh, NCAA sportscaster too. I love listening to him do the games because he has such a high-level insight, you know. And uh, he just does a, such a great job with the games, I think. But him as a player, when he got to the NBA – um, he was on the Portland Trailblazers, one of the best championship teams that I thought I ever saw in terms of teamwork, in terms of cohesion. And then uh, a, a short time later, he was out of Portland, played for the Celtics a little bit later, but what was supposed to be a storied NBA career was ruined by the fact that he had injuries to his lower extremities. And that's what happens with really, really large players who have to go up and down an NBA floor for a long time. Yep. So when you tell me it's Oscar Wimbayana and it's Scoot Henderson and it's Amen and Osar Thompson as your first four picks, and none of those players have ever played a minute in the NCAA, I say, hold on. Let's wait a second here. Let's go back and look at some of the players that we've had in the NCAA tournament yep. and take a look at this. Now, when you talk about the Thompson Twins, okay, another good band from the 80s, Pete, the Thompson Twins. Mm -hmm. So we go in and we talk to Thompson Twins, Orsor and Amen Thompson. What a great name mom gave him, Amen. Maybe after the second twin, must have been Osar was born first. And then after the second one, the mom said amen because that was such a <laughs> tough delivery. And then they thought it might have been his name. <clears throat> I'm not sure, but it is a beautiful name for somebody. But those two gentlemen are, are slated to be drafted somewhere between four, five, and six hole. In the, NCAA, in the NBA draft. They play in this league called Overtime Elite. I couldn't tell you anybody else who plays in the league, but they play in this league that's supposed to prepare people for the NBA. The funny thing is, is that these young men have a gentlemanly wager of $1 million between the two of them to see who gets drafted first. <laughs> that's un what? unbelievable. Two brothers. They're twins. They're both going to be drafted in the high first round. Uh, one's one. They're both six nine, six ten, and they shoot the ball well. They they pass the ball well, but one is slated to get drafted uh, one or two picks in front of the other. They're both very very close. So what they've done is they've gone out and said we're going to bet a million dollars against each other that whoever gets drafted first wins the million dollars. And I think mom's going to come in there at some point and, and maybe knock that one out of there. But I, I, I find that really funny that the two of them, uh, with their first paycheck, are willing to gamble a million dollars to say that they're better than the other. And it's, it's, it's tough with twins. <laughs> it's always tough with twins. They're very competitive. I just, so I just Googled this Overtime Elite League. It's six teams that play in the same arena, and it's a professional league for 16- to 20-year-olds. So yeah. why bother going to high school or college at this point then? 
And it's a way for people. I think we can go back again, Pete. We talked about this in the first show, the second show. Why force these players to go to college? Why force them to go into college? Why force them to go into a pro situation? If they can enter into the NBA draft and get drafted in the first two rounds, show up at draft camp, make the team, grab a contract, and go all the way through, then they deserve to have that. I don't see how you get away with that in a, in a restraint of trade conversation. I don't know how you get away with that with, with, without having employment attorneys all over this stuff. You can turn pro in tennis anytime you want. A really good golfer doesn't need to go to college. And so I, I think the one-and-done rule has really been disruptive in it. And what it does is it, it kind of it, it takes out some of these young men that, and, 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 and maybe rightfully so, but when they show up in college and they think they're one-and-done, they don't have the type of one-and-done year that's going to make an NBA general manager's uh, clipboard wag. So they go in there, and if they could have not gone to college, they would have made millions of dollars being drafted on the potential that they have. Once they were forced to go to college, now the NBA general managers got a much more honest look at them and said, nah, we'll draft them later on. We're not going to get them. But what you did was you took millions of dollars out of this young man's pocket because had he not gone to college, they would have drafted him. They would have taken him in the second round. They would have taken him in the first round, given him a chance to make the team and see what he can do. And so I think that that's something that needs to be taken out as well. We talked about the NIL. Charlie Baker needs to take out the one-and-done rule. If a student wants to apply for the NBA draft at any time after they're 18 years of age, I think they should be able to do that. And if they're good enough before they're 18 years of age, well, then there should be some consideration to that as well, too. It's holding up these young men from making millions of dollars. And it also it takes the NBA out of making those difficult decisions because the NBA didn't like it because they were having some of these young men come in and they were turning out to be busts. They weren't turning out to be great players because the NBA hadn't done their homework. The NBA didn't have the right evaluation people on there. The NBA didn't take their time and really, really look into who are you going to spend a million, two million, three million dollars on? Yep. And so without doing their homework, without doing all of that stuff, you wind up with a number of different people like Holmgren who didn't even play in the NBA. But look at last year's NBA first round and tell me who are the guys in there that are absolutely killing it. There's not a whole lot of them. If you go through the top 100 players in ESPN that were high school players that then wound up going to college and then saying all of these guys in the top 100 are told by the people on the perimeter that you're top 100, that means you're going to go in the NBA draft. That means you're going to go in the lottery. Just based on 100 numbers alone, there's not 100 players drafted in the NBA draft. So anybody to tell you because you're in the top 100, you're going to go to the NBA draft. You have to be careful who you listen to in this business. And also, when you say take those top 100 players, how many minutes a game are they averaging at their combined schools right now? And it's about 15 minutes a game. The top 100 are averaging about 15 minutes a game. Now, some of them had great careers. Filipowski, uh, Lively at Duke went right in there, and, and, and they're great players in their own right. But most of the top 100 – they're on the bench. Most of the top 100 are freshmen earning their way in, and that's the best way basketball programs operate. When they operate on a seniority model, where you have players who've been there for four years, know your system, they're ready to lead. You have juniors and sophomores in there who are now taking their second step through the program, their third step through the program, and are ready to contribute on a high level. If you're playing a lot of freshmen, and you take out the Michigan Fab Five from this, there's not a lot of indication where you can go out and play a lot of freshmen and you're going to be successful. If you're young in our business, you're going to lose. If you come in with a young group of guys, no matter how good they are, you're still going to lose. And you see that that's very, very hard to calibrate, and it's very, very hard to sustain. Because look at Kentucky right now. They went to the one and done. They were the one and done capital of the world with Coach Calipari and all that other stuff. And right now, they're having trouble because, A, when you're one and done, you're losing players in one year, and you have to go find new players. And so the players, as they learn your system and learn your way of doing things in the basketball culture, are now leaving. And so who's going to tell the young players about your culture? Who's going to tell your young players about your system? You have nobody there to tell your story. You have nobody there to tell your narrative as a coach. And so, therefore, everybody else is up for grabs. The narrative, the culture, everything becomes up for grabs now because there's not that seniority, those elder statesmen in the program who say, hey, don't do that. 
because you're going to get on the bad side of coach. Or, hey, coach really wants everybody going to class and doing their work. You better get on board here because if he finds out you're not going to class, you're not going to play. That was the beauty of the New England Patriots locker room for years and years and years. It's sports. Yeah. It's sports. It's culture. It's vibration. It's tangible. You can actually feel it. I've been in locker rooms that have been unbelievably vibrational, and I've been in locker rooms where you wanted to just get your stuff and get out of there as fast as you could at the end of the game. And it's a huge, huge difference. And the good teams have it, and the bad teams don't. And that's what separates them. But as you go into the draft, okay, there's a couple of names out there. You know, Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana has had an unbelievable career in Indiana. Chris Murray, his brother Keegan Murray, was drafted into the NBA and did very, very well out of Iowa. I like Chris Murray a lot, too. I think when you're talking about uh, Brandon Miller and Jerry Walker from Houston, they have the physical NBA bodies to do it, but I'm not sure where they're at in the skill level, and that's why I don't have them as high as I do in the draft. I don't know how you don't look at the big guy, Zach, from Purdue at seven foot four, two 285 pounds. He's a, he's a, he's a specimen. He's an, he's an unbelievable body. And that's something that, as we say in the coaching business, you can't teach that. You can't teach that stuff. And so I think what you're looking at is you're going to have possibly, uh, say, let's Donovan Klingon. Let's say Filipowski from Duke goes in there. You're going to see some really, really good young big men that the NBA is going to have to make some decisions about. Are they NBA ready right now? Are they NBA ready in two years? Are they going to be able to come in and contribute on our team? And it also matters, you know, what are we looking for? You know, a team that has uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo on their team isn't looking for a four-man. They're looking for somebody to compliment him. You know, somebody that has Kevin Durant on their team isn't looking for a big forward. They're looking for somebody to compliment him. So that happens in the draft as well. Sometimes they'll say, hey, we're taking the best available, you know, but I don't know how they go in the NBA these days because I think right now, by and large, when you watch a mock draft, when you look at any of this stuff that shows up on there, most of these people, again, we go back to the NBA commissioners, the the people that are at the echelon, the top echelons of these organizations, they're not basketball people. And you're having situations where they're not basketball made decisions then. And people would say, Rich, I hear you, but there's there's so many lawyers and so many collective bargaining agreements and contracts and, and salary cap agreements and all this other stuff that's really, really tied up in legalese, you know? And and, and one of the things that I think upsets people to a, to a large portion with some of this stuff is if you can't read it to a five-year-old and make sense with it, it really doesn't make sense a whole lot. And mm-hmm. so if you have to have these collective bargaining agreements, you say what's actually in there and then you need a team of lawyers to tell you what's in there that it's that leaves so much open to interpretation and so you sit there and say okay who's your ideal nba commissioner that's a that's a great question who would it be i'll give you one right now kenny smith kenny the jet smith from tnt Okay, he works with Charles Barkley. He's covered the game of NBA and NCAA basketball for years. He played at the highest level at North Carolina, an All-American, and he went to Archbishop Malloy High School where I worked. I actually worked with his brother Vincent, but just I'm saying as a top echelon, as a commissioner, you have to have a basketball person. Would he you take that have, job? Would he take it? Yeah. I think he would. I think you, if you threw – um, a situation where you, I would, I would look at Charles Barkley as well. I know. I, I think Barkley, I, Charles would, his, his insights are, are tremendous, and, and he would, and, he would put and he up with a lot of crap. And he doesn't put up with a lot of that stuff. Yeah, he would be, he would be a little bit forceful as a leader, and I think that's what some people are looking for. Um, but we're coming up on one o'clock, Pete. It's almost yep. time, and I'm so glad we have that clock in the room because I could just keep going and going <laughs> and going because this is something that we really, really love. But as we get into the draft, we're actually going to do a draft here on one of our shows. Hopefully we can do it within the hour because that's going to be somewhat complicated um, to get it all done and get it out. But we'll try hopefully to wait to see who's actually going to be drafting the teams, what what NBA teams will be in what order. And they don't do that until they get after 
um, the draft selection. So what we want to do in, in the zone right now is we're going to give you one second. We're going to give you, we gave you a drill last week, and I heard from a lot of people that they liked the drill. A couple of my college teammates rolled, rolled up on me and said that they used to do that drill all the time when they were at home. And so we're going to give you another one today on the shooting form, okay? When you enter a gym, you're a young player, old player, doesn't matter what you do. Whenever you walk into the gym and you get ready to practice, to get ready to shoot, to get ready to do anything, stand under the basket and shoot with one hand. Stand under the basket and shoot only with one hand as close to the basket as you can get for the first five minutes that you're in the gym. I know everybody wants to grab the ball, head out to the three-point line, and see how the three balls work in that day and, and get it going. But if, if you really, really want to become a better shooter, get to some form shooting right around the basket so you work on your form. If you want to see good form, watch Caitlin Clark shoot the basketball from Iowa. She has tremendous form on her shot, tremendous ability to shoot the ball. And it's all about release and getting rid of the ball. And so with that said, Go into the gym and shoot with one arm, one hand, and keep repeating that for the first 20, 25 shots you take, and you'll see a lot of difference um, in your shooting ability when you start to do that. But in the zone also, we would like to wish everybody Happy Easter because we're in the Easter season, and we want to uh, – this is a time of resurrection. And so what we talk about also is in that time of resurrection, you don't have to believe in resurrection in order to rise. And so what we want everybody to do is go home, relax, have a great weekend, come back on Monday ready to rise. Thank you. Appreciate you being in the zone. Hopefully we can get over 215 this week in YouTube.